Well, good morning. As Jamie said, I'm Rima and I work on the staff team here and it's a real joy to speak this morning as we look at God's word together. Um, Let's pray. God, we thank you that your word is the truth and it brings comfort to us and it brings challenge to us and we pray, Lord, that we would have open hearts to you now. Pray, come Holy Spirit and speak to us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we are starting a new sermon series in the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke chapter four, we read about the beginning of Jesus' ministry and he declares these words in the synagogue. And they're from Isaiah, and we read them in chapter four of Luke. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And there is such a sense of celebration in these verses. Good news to the poor, the prisoners being set free, sight for the blind. And Jesus is telling us about what he has come to do, the way that he is bringing the kingdom of God. And everything that we see that follows in the rest of chapters four, five, and six that we'll be looking at, the healings, the miracles, the way that Jesus interacts with people, this is Jesus showing us what the kingdom of God looks like. So our passage for this morning is from Luke chapter five, verses 27 to 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax collector booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? But Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Over the last year, one of the things that we haven't been able to do in the same way is celebrate. There's been birthdays, Christmas, Weddings, friends and families getting new jobs. And maybe you've been able to join online for a party or you've spoken to someone on the phone when something good or special has happened. During lockdown, I went to something called a kitchen party and it was my first time at kitchen party. And in Zambian culture, it's the equivalent of a bridal shower where the bride celebrates with the people closest to her. And there was lots of dancing, even some dancing with wooden spoons, and it was great fun. And as restrictions ease and it becomes safer for us to be in person again, there's more opportunities for us to celebrate with others in person. And in our passage today, we see Jesus celebrating with others at a banquet because of the good news that he brings. And the party that they're at, it's both exciting and eventful. So, how does the party get started? Well, it starts with a simple but unexpected act from Jesus. It starts with an invitation. Jesus reaches out to a man named Levi. Verse 27 says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And this word for saw in verse 27 is so much more than a quick glance. It means to view attentively, to really notice. 
Jesus looked at Levi with the intent of speaking with him. And at that time, it would have been shocking that Jesus interacted with Levi in this way. Tax collectors were absolutely hated by the Jewish people. They were politically unclean because they joined forces with the Romans, the very people who were oppressing the Jewish people. They were ceremonially unclean because they were mixing with the Gentiles. And they were morally unclean, known for being selfish and greedy and often taking money for themselves, cheating people. People did not want to look at them, let alone spend time with them and speak to them. But Jesus, he sees Levi. He sees him there sitting in his tax collector booth. He sees him there sitting in his sin, all the dirt and the corruption. And Jesus, he speaks to Levi and he gives him an invitation. He says, follow me. And how does Levi respond? Have a look at verse 28. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Levi gives up everything that he knows. He throws away his security. And he does this because he sees that Jesus is different. Jesus is better than anyone else or anything else that he has seen or known. And the word for left in verse 28, it's the same word that's often used when someone dies. So there's very strong language here. Jesus completely lays down, sorry, Levi completely lays down everything for Jesus. He left everything. And as he gets up from that tax collector booth and chooses Jesus, he comes into a new life. He is a new person and will become Matthew, one of the disciples of Jesus. Levi sees that Jesus is worth following wholeheartedly. He's worth completely being committed to. So this is how the party gets started, with an invitation from Jesus to follow him and with Levi responding. Let's have a look at who else was there. Verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. The people there at the banquet, they were the misfits, the despised, the sinners. These were the people who didn't get invited to parties. They didn't get invited to anything. And in that verse, it says that there was a large crowd of people, many welcomed in. And Jesus, his offer is for everyone and he completely rewrites the rule book of who should or shouldn't be there. Many of us will be familiar with the game Musical Chairs and maybe you played it when you were younger or maybe you've seen children play the game. And each round, the music stops and a chair is taken away and the group becomes smaller and smaller, more exclusive as the rounds go on. And in the kingdom of God, it's like the reverse of musical chairs. The chairs keep on being added. The kingdom of God keeps on expanding. More and more people join in. And God can use us as the people who bring out those chairs. The question is, are we ready to get up and bring out those chairs? Or are we sitting comfortably? The meal that Jesus had was made up of a collection of different characters. And frankly, they don't seem like the easiest people to spend time with. When we look at our lives, 
Who are the people that we spend time with? Who are the people that we love? Are they all just like us? When I was at university, there was an elderly couple who used to look after students and they used to give us food and spend time with us and they showed us God in the most amazing way. Who is God calling each of us to show radical hospitality to? That neighbor who is hurting and broken. The colleague who is difficult, the homeless, the prisoner, the orphan, the stranger, the widow. These are the people that God invites in to know his love. At HTC, we have Clapham Sunday coming up. And this is a great opportunity for us to gather with people from different walks of life and share Christ with them. Let's think about who we can invite Later in the passage, we see a disruption to the banquet. The party has been crashed. Verse 30 says, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? We see time and time again in the Gospels that the Pharisees, they just don't get it. They don't understand Jesus or what he's doing. And the Pharisees, they think they're better than everyone else. They think they're morally superior. They are the ones who are clean. The Pharisees, they were self-righteous. How could Jesus eat and drink with the tax collectors and the others who were unclean? They had really messed up. They had completely failed to keep God's law. The Pharisees put themselves in a different category to other people. They were in a different category to the people that Jesus was with. And how often do we do the same thing? We put ourselves in a different category to other people, thinking that we live better lives than they do. I know that I do that. And the Pharisees' response to Jesus is so different to Levi's. He saw his sinful state and his need for Jesus. Levi humbly saw that he needed a saviour. And the Pharisees, on the other hand, they thought they'd save themselves for their religious rituals and their idea of what holiness was. It was pride that had clouded their vision Timothy Keller, a well-known pastor and theologian, says this about pride. Pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It silently and slowly kills you without you even knowing. We don't speak about pride very often. It's not as obvious as other sins to us, like lying or murder. But when pride creeps in, it distorts the way that we see things. We don't see our sin and we don't see our need for God. And there are different ways that pride can creep into our lives. One of the ways is through complacency. Maybe we've been a Christian for a long time and we've been following God for a long time and there's certain sins in our lives that we've become numb to. We know that God is loving and gracious and forgiving. So we carry on and we don't even realize the sin in our lives. We've accepted Jesus as Lord once, so it's all okay. And we've forgotten how devastating sin is. Another way that pride can creep in is by us judging others. We think and say things like, God would have to do something really amazing for that person to become a Christian. 
that person really needs Jesus. We look at people outside of the church and we judge them, we judge their lives, forgetting that we need saving just as much as they do. And we look at people inside the church and expect them not to slip up. And when they do, we think they're bad Christians. And when we do this, we focus so much on other people's sin that we miss the sin in our own lives. And and the third way that pride can creep in is when we play God. And this is perhaps the least obvious form of pride. We think things like, We are so unworthy. We are so beyond God saving us because of the sin in our lives. And when we do this, we actually put ourselves in the position of God because we are judging our own sin. If God has said, when we confess our sins to him, we are forgiven. If God has said that the work of Jesus on the cross means salvation for us, Who are we to question that? Who are we to say that we can't be saved? Like the Pharisees, when we have pride in our hearts, it cuts us off from being in relationship with Jesus. Pride and self-righteousness are one of the greatest enemies to the gospel. And this is because pride keeps us from seeing our sin. Pride keeps us from seeing our sinful state so we don't repent. Self-righteousness keeps us from seeing our need for a saviour. And pride and self-righteousness keep us from sharing the invitation with others. And this is because we have judged them according to our own standards and not God's. Once the Pharisees have asked their question of why the disciples and Jesus are with the tax collectors and sinners, Jesus responds with this in verse 31. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus clearly lays out in these verses why he is here, why he's with the people at the banquet, but not just them, why he has this mission on earth to proclaim the kingdom, to proclaim the good news to all people. He has come to save. Jesus, he is the doctor, the great physician. And we go to a doctor for help, but we have to recognize our need first. Before I moved to Clapham, I broke a bone in my foot, falling off a bicycle, and I was hobbling around for a few days, and then someone in my family suggested I should probably go and see a doctor. And I was in denial for um, a few days, but it was only once I recognized my need that I could go to the doctor and get help. Jesus came to save those who are ill, those who are sick with the disease of sin. And the reality is, that's all of us. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have messed up. There is not one of us who is unscathed by this illness of sin. But Jesus, he is the doctor that saves completely. And on the cross of Calvary, Jesus was wounded so that we would be healed. We know spiritual healing. We know our sins being cleansed, our souls being made whole through the work of Jesus. God 
God, by the power of his spirit, helps us to recognize our sin and our need for Jesus. So our hearts are open. And for the Pharisees, their hearts were hardened by pride. So they could not see their sin. They could not see their need for Jesus. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. In our Christian lives, our continual flow of us turning to God and turning away from sin We continually confess the things that we have done against God and know his forgiveness. The invitation from Jesus is this. It's to repent and follow him. And this is the way to the ultimate celebration. This is the way to the best party that we'll ever go to. It is through Jesus. It is through faith in Jesus that we will be with him for eternity and we will celebrate. So the challenge for us today is this. Do we see our need for Jesus? Have we become like the Pharisees with pride and self-righteousness blocking us from seeing the sin in our lives? Have we limited the invitation that we extend to people or do we see others as Jesus sees them? Levi saw his need, responded and shared the invitation with others. Let's do the same, sharing the invitation of Jesus with the people in our lives, having him as the guest of honour. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you today that you are the one who saves. And we thank you that you see the sin and the mess in our lives and yet you offer us an invitation to follow you, to be with you. We need you, God, and we are sorry when we have forgotten. When we've forgotten that and we've let pride get in the way. We turn to you again the one who saves completely. In the name of Jesus, amen.